So last time we ended the class by talking about multidimensional arrays, which sounds like a complicated subject, but is in fact very simple. So do we understand arrays? Do we understand this notion that an array is nothing more than a list of information? It's just a list. That's all an array is. So a multidimensional array is simply a list that has lists inside of it. It's effectively a list of lists. Those lists can in turn have lists, which can in turn have lists, et cetera, et cetera. This is why they're called multidimensional arrays, right? Um, so we went through this rather quickly last time. So let, let's review multidimensional arrays first. Then we'll move forward and talk about jQuery. So, so for about two weeks, we were focusing on server-side development using Node.js. And we will return to that, and we'll, you'll see how we'll leverage some of that information moving forward. But let's take a step back and move back to the browser and talk about how from JavaScript, we can communicate with the HTML tree that is drawn on your screen. That is to say, I want us, all of us, to be able to, from our code, manipulate what we're seeing on the screen. Also, I want us to be able to get events when things happen on the screen. Imagine these menus that you see, right, where you mouse over a button and this menu flies open. And then you move your mouse away and the menu disappears again. Ever wondered how that works, right? So, yeah, so, okay, so you can use, right, so you can use some library functions, but underneath the covers, what's happening is when, you're, when things change in the tree, when mouse moves or something gets clicked, an event is raised. You can then, as a programmer, register to these events, which is a complicated way of saying you can just say, when this happens, call this function, right? Okay, so when the mouse comes into the button, your function is called. You can then do things like select that element and make it bigger. Then when the mouse goes out, you can get another event, that is to say, have the function get called again, where you can refer to that element and make it smaller. It's that simple. At the end of the day, it's just a bunch of JavaScript. But in order to communicate with the DOM, that is to say this HTML tree, we will use a library called jQuery, which is a very popular library. I think it's the most popular JavaScript library out there. Um, so we'll get back to that in a moment. So first, again, let's talk about uh, multidimensional arrays. Can everyone see the code? Yes? OK. So if you will recall, we create an array by creating two brackets next to each other. This means I have created an array and I have placed that array into A. Hi. <laughs> OK. All right, so in the first line of code, what I've done is I've created an array, and I've placed it into a variable called A, right? I can now refer to this array using a. So I can say a, well, index of, say, 0, is going to be 1. a index of 1 is going to be some other number. So what I've done here is I've created an array, placed two values into the array, a 1 into the 0 index of the array, and an 83 in the second index of the array. That is to say, index 1. What is the length of this array? 2. two. How did you determine that? Last index plus one. Exactly. Last index plus 1. What this means is that if I were to do a index of, say, 73, and I were to place in there 8, the length of this array would be? 74. Very good. OK. So we understand that. Yes? What would be the length of a for Exactly. Exactly. It's exactly, so anytime in JavaScript you think of something is empty, it has no value, assume that we mean undefined. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so just as you understand then that this array can have numbers, this array can also have text, right? Uh, 
So if I were to then read what is at index of 1, what would I get back? B. Exactly, right? Okay, so we understand we can put values in there, such as, well, numbers, text. Well, we can also put objects. Objects are also values, right? So I could just as easily put in an object in here. Another object in here. Another object in here. And so if I were to do a index of 1, I would get back a reference to this object here. With me so far? Now let's, in this object, initialize this object, I should say, with some values. Like foo is 1, bar is some text, and do is, do, do is I don't know, true. I can now do a1.foo. Remember, a1 will return to me this object. I'm then using the dot notation to refer to this in order to get back that. Is that clear? Okay, so then tell me. Tell me this. Suppose I now had in this object a zoo that referred to an array. In this array, I had an object, and in that object, I had a name of AUA. How do I get AUA? Okay so, okay, so step by step. A1, that will return to me this object here, right? I then want to get this, which means I use zoo to access it. That will then return to me this array. And this array can have lots of things in it, right? I want the first thing. In other words, I want the thing or the value at the zero index. So I do zero. That then will return to me this. I then want the AUA, which is name, right? So I do dot name. Does that make sense? It's just a long, so here's the thing with complexity. It starts off with really simple parts. You then combine them together and get complicated things. We can make this object as complicated as you can imagine. We can nest an object inside of an object, inside of an array, inside of an object, an array, 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 object, array, right? This can keep going, arbitrarily complicated. But the point is, once you understand how this works, the depth does not matter. Right? It's like once you understand a language, the, the size of the sentence isn't going to kill you. Right? You can read a big sentence or a small. As long as you understand the words in the grammar, the rest is okay. Right? So don't be scared. Be like, oh my god, it's so long. It's not that hard. It's very simple things repeating. Questions so far, just on this part? No questions? Okay. So now that you understand that we can put an array inside of an object or in an object inside of an array, well, we can also put an array inside of an array, right? Okay, so let's put an array at index 0, an array at index 1, and an array on index 2, let's say. Okay, so now we have an array of A, which at 0 has an array, at 1 has another array, and at 2 has another array. What is this, the length of A? 3. Good. So the, the last index plus 1, 3. Fine. What is the length of the first value inside of, inside of A? Right. So the first value inside of A would be this, and the length of this is 0 because it has nothing inside. Yes? Okay. So let's put something inside. Let's put A, B, and C. And in here, let's put I don't know, D, E, and F. And in here, let's put I don't know, true, true, and false, whatever. OK, so now we have a list of lists where the first list is this, the second list is that, and the third list is that. So far, it's pretty easy, right? OK, so now the next question is, how do I get back a reference to this list? A1, that's right. A1 will give me back this list. So now from that, how do I get E? 
Right. So this is the zero index. This is the one index. This is the two index, right? So index of one. So this part here will return this array. And then this part here will return the one index, which is E. Right. Is this easy? Anyone think, anyone confused by this? Cake, right? Fine. Now, let's create an array inside of that array. Don't get nervous. It's the same thing repeating. It's just one more level. So in here, let's put, I don't know, one, two, three. In this, let's put four, five, six. And in here, let's put seven, eight, and nine. OK. So how do I access, tell me, uh, six? OK. All right, all right. So wait. OK, so again, remember. We break it down, don't worry, we break it down into small parts. First question, how do I get a reference to this big array? A index 1. A index 1, see there it is. A index 1 now has this stuff in it, right? So A1, fine. Now within this, I want to access not the first value, but the second value, right? Index one. Index one. Right, because the second index is 1, right? Now I get back this. Now from within that, what index do I use to access 6? 2. Remember, 0, 1, 2. Is this clear? Is anyone confused? Raise your hands if you're even a you're confused. Okay. How do I translate this into Porsches and OK, all right, let's figure this out. Const A. OK, that's easy, right on? OK. Within an array, I can have values. One, two, three. With me so far? OK. Anna, how do I access the second value in this array? That is to say, how do I access two? Exactly, right? Because this is the 0 index, this is the 1 index, that's the 2 index. Very good. All right, so A1 will give you 2. Easy, right? Okay, now let's replace these with lists. That's a list, that's a list, and that's a list. And then these lists have inside of them 1, 2, 3, let's say 4, 5, 6, and then 7, 8, and 9. Right? How do I access the second list? It's the same question. A, exactly, because remember, this is at the 0 index, this is at the 1 index, and that's the 2 index, right? So A1 will now give me the second list. So now, I'm just asking the same question again. Inside of this list, how do I get 6? OK. So this part will get me the second array. This part will get me the, the third value, that is to say not this, not this, but that value in that array. Easy, right? Yeah, OK, you're shaking your head, so I'm assuming it is. Now let's turn this into another list. And let's have this have you know A and B. Let's have this B, C, and D. And let's not worry about the last one. How do I access C? This, wait, wait, this will return this, this array here, right? This long array. Two will return the second, uh, sorry, the last one. Shoot, OK, sorry, this one. Here, let's change this to 0. OK, 0 means it's going to return the first one, that's this. And then inside of this, let's get B. Hanson has me, Hansa. You sure? Anyone else confused by this? We understand multi dimensional arrays. Good. Remember. Again, I'm going to repeat this one more time to keep it very simple. 
An array is a list of things, a list of values. It can be a list of numbers, it can be a list of strings, it can be a list of booleans, it can be a list of functions. You can have functions in your array. A list of objects, a list of arrays. That is to say, a list of lists. A list can contain lists. That means it's a recursive thing, right? If you can have a list that has lists, then that list can have lists. Then that list can have lists, and that list can have lists, and that list can have lists, and that can have lists. Barza? Clear. Okay. Good. So we'll have an assignment on multidimensional arrays so that you guys can work on it a little bit, get your hands dirty to understand exactly why it's there, how it can be used. Um, but for today, I think that's enough. Let's move on to jQuery. Okay. So a few words about jQuery. So jQuery is a JavaScript library, and by that all I mean is it's a file that has code in it that was written by someone other than you, right? So it was written by some really smart people out in the Boston area, but then other people also contributed. Um, and then uh, it became open source, so that, that is to say you can use it for free without paying the money for it, which is really nice of them. Um, there are a few facts that you need to know about. So first, it was originally created by this guy, John Resig, really cool guy. In fact, if you guys have ever been to Khan Academy, uh, for those of you who have been to Khan Academy and have tried their programming thing, where it's like a movie, but then you can stop it and write code, he wrote that too. Really cool guy, really smart. Um, so he wrote uh, jQuery in 2006, so jQuery is a fairly mature library. Um, it's also, so one of the things that you should learn as you move forward is licensing. Um, if you use code that is under like a strict license, you can get sued, right? You're not allowed to just use any code you want. So be careful about just taking code off the web because you can get in trouble. Watch out for licensing. So one of the most popular licenses in, in libraries is the MIT license. This is one of the best licenses. This basically means do whatever you want with the code. Use it, change it, whatever you want, just don't sue the person who wrote it. That's all it means. So, uh, and, and jQuery is in fact an MIT licensed software. So how do we use jQuery? Well, so jQuery in its program, when it runs the code, it puts all of its stuff, and you'll see what I mean by stuff, it's actually just a function, but it adds it to the global namespace. What that means is that their variable, which is called jQuery, it's also called dollar because it's the same thing, is available to you everywhere. It's global. It's at the very top, which means no matter what function you're in, you can always go up, 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 up until you find that variable. Remember how I was saying that variable resolution? You go up until you find what you need? Well, jQuery is at the very top, which means once you pull the library in, you can refer to jQuery from anywhere in your code. So, one thing, uh, before we start jQuery, one thing. Suppose I were to create a variable like, I don't know, let a be three. I could also have that be, hang on, actually let's have it be a function. We have a function that we put into A, right? Now if I do let B be A, we now have the same function being referred to by B. What this means is that A and B are basically the same thing. They have the same values inside, right? So one is, and this is a term that's often used, an alias of the other. That is to say one is basically the same as the other. It just has a different name. In jQuery, you will often see people use this, and then you will often see people use this. The two variables refer to the same exact thing. Okay, So this, a variable that, that is inside of dollar, is the same value in it as the variable jQuery. With me so far? So the first thing you do in order to use jQuery is you need to download jQuery. 
Well, how can you download jQuery? Well, there are two ways. One is you can actually go to their site and download the code. And then once you have it on your server, you can then use a relative path, much the way you were referring to your own JavaScript files inside of the script tag. You can refer to jQuery from a script tag. You can also put in the actual HTTP like full address of a jQuery that might be sitting on a completely different server. All you have to know if this complicated things is that here you put the address of where the JavaScript file is. That's it. What the server will then do, or I should say what the browser will then do, is as, it, as it's reading your HTML, it will say, oh, script tag, and it will go download this code and then run it. It will then keep going and say, oh, script tag, nothing to download because there's no source, run the code that's inside. Is that clear? OK. So again, this is exactly the same as the way it would load your own library, your own file. Except instead of loading your file, you're loading that file. OK? Right. So once you do that, you now have jQuery that you can use. So OK, so let's get rid of this just to simplify things. So what is jQuery? Bless you. Let me get rid of all that code to make it nice and simple. So jQuery is a function, okay? It gives you a function. This dollar or jQuery, which are the same thing, remember? But for now, let's just use the dollar because it's shorter, is a function which I can call. The arguments to this function vary, but the simplest one is a text that is a CSS selector. What the heck is a CSS selector, you might be asking. Raise your hands if you now are comfortable with CSS. OK. All the people who kind of did homework one. OK. I'm not saying you have to be an expert in CSS, but that just you understand the concepts behind it. OK. If you understand the concepts behind it, let me ask you this. How do you style every element of a given name, like li, Right, so, so, okay, tell me this. How do I write CSS where I will make every li have the font color red? So here's how I would do it, right? So here's, I, I have some HTML. Let's create a style tag. In here, let's select li. And let's say that the color needs to be red. And we've now turned it all red. Right? This is not jQuery, this is just basic CSS, which you all know. Yes? Okay. So let me ask you this. Suppose I wanted this Li, the Yerevan Li, and the Gyumri Li to have the color red, the font color red, but just Yerevan and Gyumri, not Vanazur. OK, so I've heard some people say ID. You're right. I could give this an ID of, say, foo. I could give this an ID of bar. I can then have this be what? How do you select IDs? I can then either do another one of these, hash bar, Wait, so someone asked a, a question. Someone said, why can't we use the same ID? What does ID mean? ID, by definition, implies uniqueness. So while you could do it, you probably shouldn't. However, there is another solution exactly for this reason. Because you can't give multiple IDs, you can give multiple, I heard it, classes. Exactly. So we can say, OK, instead of giving IDs and getting Yerevan and Gyumri to be red, we can instead give them the same class of, say, Fu. Now, how do I select Fu as a class? Dot Fu. So there are three things I want you to memorize. So in, in reality, the selection 
uh, syntax in CSS is much more involved. But for this class, you will only need three things. Select an element by name, select an element by ID, and select an element by class. Know those three things and you can do almost everything. Everything that we'll need to do here, okay? There's much more to be learned, of course, but I'll leave that up to you. So again, to review, if I want to select an element by name, what do I do? I write its name. So I write, say, li, which is the name of the element, right? And that selects everything that is an li and changes its color, that is to say its font color, to red, which is why I get Yerevan van Azorgyumri as red. If I don't do that, by default, of course, it's the default colors, which is black. With me so far? Good. If I wanted to select a single element, what's a good way to do it? I can give it an ID. So let's give Van Azor an ID of Joe. I can now refer to Joe with just write Joe like this. OK, so question. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, question. Why can't I just do that? Exactly. Because just writing a name implies you're trying to specify the name of the tag, right? So we have to tell the parser, the thing that actually executes or tries to make sense of what we're doing here, we have to tell it this is a class or this is an ID or this is a type, right? So in this case, this is an ID. So we say hash to specify an ID, and so vanadzor becomes the only thing that is read. Remember, CSS works like this. You have your selector, which matches elements, and then you have the stuff that you want to do on that selector. So in this case, we're saying find everything that has the ID of Joe. Of course, there is one. And then we're saying on that one element, change its color to red, which is why, of course, Vanadzor is red. Is that clear? Yes, good. OK, we can also select by class. Class is, again, it's used when you want to specify multiple elements. Suppose I also have something else in here. I don't know, a div. And then I have a bunch of text. In, and in here, I have a class, foo. Here, if I do exactly dot foo, it will turn this into this, sorry, this red, this red, and that red. Sure enough. Is that clear? If this is not clear, you're not going to understand jQuery. So be absolutely sure you get this. If anyone wants me to review this a little bit more, raise your hands. We're good. OK, let's dive into jQuery. Hang on. OK. So in jQuery, what we have is, remember, a dollar, which, which is a variable that has in it a function. We can call that function. The arguments that we can pass to that function is a CSS selector. So if I wanted to select every, all, Yerevan, the, this, that is to say the li with, which has Yerevan in it, the Vanadzor li and the Gyumri li, what's a simple selector I can use? Li. Good. So what this will do is it will run, that is to say it will then walk the HTML tree and find this and this and this, turn it into an object or keep it into an object and then return that object. Which I can then do, let's say const a is the result of that. Question. If I were to do a.length, what do you think I would get back? Three. Very good. Because in, in that list, I have one, two, three things that matched. Right? So jQuery allows you, among other things, to find elements in your tree, in your HTML tree, and return them to you. Is that clear? OK. So let's keep going. So furthermore, you can reference any of those elements 
by using the array syntax. That is to say, if I were to do this, what would this return? Vanazoj. This would be in the zero index, this would be in the one index, and this would be in the two index. Is that clear? Okay. So, among other things, one of the things that we can do is we can, on A, perform operations. Now, if you have a list of elements, and I were to say change them to red, it would change every element in that array to red. What I want to do instead is call a function called HTML. I want to then pass to HTML, hi. Look what happened. So what HTML does is when you pass an argument to it, is it will set that as the HTML inside of that element. Remember that in this case, the elements that we got back were li, li, and li. And by doing this, what we did was change that to high, change that to high, and change that to high. But we did it programmatically. This is important. This is key. The fact that you can write code that can affect what you see on the screen is really, really cool. This is what really made, made Netscape Navigator kind of cool, right? You started off with websites that were just static. That is to say, whatever you got from the server, the text, the HTML that you got from the server, is what you would see. But now, finally, we had a scripting language, a language that could actually live, while you're looking at it, change what you're seeing. It could change Yerevan Vanazor and Gyumri to, hi. How would you convert, for example, Gyumri? Very good question. So if you only wanted to select Gyumri, you have to change your selector. How can I only select Gyumri? Think CSS. I could give it an ID of hi. I could then here, how do I select things by ID? And now only, only Gyumri turns into hi. Make sense? Yes, sir. So you can. The problem with an, yes, you can. But watch this. If you refer to a, an element by its index, so let's say a of 0, that's going to return Yerevan, yes? But the problem is it doesn't return to a jQuery object. It literally returns to the element itself. But here's what you can do. You can wrap that with a jQuery object. So remember that I mentioned that jQuery, the function, can take lots of different things. One of them is a CSS query, whereby it will then go find all the elements in, in a tree and return them to you in one object. Yes? The other thing you can do is pass to it an element, and it will wrap it with a jQuery object and return to you the object. Why would you want to do this? Well, because now that you've done this, you now have access to the jQuery functions. There you go. Wait a minute. Ah, sorry, sorry. So this was uh, LA. There you go. Clear? Sort of. Okay. Now, just so you know, the HTML is a function that is attached to the object that jQuery returns to you. Right? That HTML function if you call it without arguments, it will return to you the, the, the HTML that's inside of the tag as one text. If you give it an argument, it will write that value as the inner text. Let me say this one more time. Say again. So be careful about doing document.write. So with document.write just means like write at the end of the document. With this, watch. You have an element. Let's have this have an, another element inside. Div. And then have that div have, I don't know, an h1. 
and then have that be uh, whatever. OK, so this is what you get at the end of the day, right? Now here what I can do is I can find that h1, and I can set a.html to, wow. Wow. Watch this. Now let's have a look at the underlying HTML. Let's open the inspect element. So in the first tab, remember we've, we've looked at console, right? Because this is where we were doing console.log. We looked at sources because this is where we do our debugging. Let's look at elements. So elements will show you the actual HTML that's rendered on your screen. So in here, you can see that inside of our body, we have an, an OL, an ordered list, which has an LI, that's to say this, another LI, van Adzoj, another LI, which has an ID of high, that inside of it has a div, inside of that has H1 with wow. So in this way, you can study the structure of the HTML. You can use this to debug your code. Is that clear? Is that clear? OK, if you're not saying it's clear, then it's probably not. OK, let's do a few other things. One of the things that you can do when you select an element is you can apply style to it. OK, um, hang on. Do we do the licensing? One second, I'll be right with you. OK, you can apply style to it. So one sec. Hang on. Moment. A ah, one sec. OK, I want to know how to apply style to jQuery. What do I do? CSS, I was right. See, dot CSS, right? And dot CSS will take the name of the attribute, the property name, and then you, you uh, hang on, where is it, where is it, where is it? I want to show you an example. Okay, there's no example, fine. Oh, sorry. Jesus. Oh, fa, va, va, va. Hang on. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. Or you could have done, hang on. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. I, I forget things too. I know. So there is a function on the jQuery object called CSS. This will allow you, at runtime, using your code, to change the style of an element, right? So you do .css to, and then you call it, and the arguments that it takes, the simplest one that you can think of, is an object that has a key value pairing of the thing you want to change and the value you want to change to. Bless you. So suppose I also wanted to change the font size. How do I do that? Anyone know the CSS attribute for font size? OK. I forgot the comma. Is that what you said? OK, I can then change that to say, so by default, by the way, this is happening in pixels. So if you wanted to use something else, like EM, which is the size, like it has something to do with the M letter, I think, um, you can do this. 
right? It's just another standard for specifying size. By default, it does this. Eee, that's tiny. Hang on. OK, that's pretty tiny. Let's do 14 pixels. Let's do 24 pixels. Let's do whatever, 64 pixels. OK, the goal of this is not to memorize style. That's not what I'm trying to show you. What I'm trying to show you is simply that from your code, from your JavaScript, you can have an effect on the HTML that you see on the screen. Is that part clear? OK, the details about what attribute you use in order to get what effect, you can figure out by just Googling. If you want to change the height of something or the size of something, just Google CSS how to set whatever. And it will tell you, and then just use it. Clear? How what opens? I don't know, but it has something to do with the size of the M character inside of the font that you're using. I think it's like the width of the M or something like that. I have to read, I can't remember what it is. It's like another standard. Exactly. Questions so far or should I continue? Okay, I'll continue. Okay. So, you guys can see the code? All right. So, in this, so we talked about this, how I can select something and set its inner HTML to whatever I want. Right? So let me get rid of this. Notice how I put B in there? What do, you, what do you think that does? Exactly, it makes it bold. If I were to put in something else, like H1. Hang on. See? It, it rendered differently. So the point is I can put any HTML I want, and it will render inside of my label tag, which is this. OK, question. If I were to put stuff in here where the cursor is, what would happen? Why? Exactly. If I were to not run my script, then you would see it. But the moment I run my script, it changes the value inside or the HTML inside of label, and I get name with H1 around it. Is that part clear? Good. Hang on. OK. So now, just like we have HTML, yes? Yeah, you can put CSS, sure. Uh, so watch this. So let's do, um, hang on, style. And let's have all the labels have a color red. Cool? Other questions? OK, all right, so let's get rid of that for a second. OK. So we also have this text function. Let me move this stuff down. We also have this notion of text. Just as we have a notion of inner HTML, we can also specify inner text. Does anyone know what the difference is? What is it? Right. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So if I were to put the same HTML code in here, It, one person says it won't run. What else? Exactly. It will render exactly that. It will render that as text, not as HTML. Is that clear? So for a given element, if you put in HTML that you want to actually see as text, you do dot .text. If you want it to run as HTML, then you do dot .html. Yeah. Oh, hello. If you just run the HTML function and you give it HTML, 
the browser will draw it like HTML. If you say text and you give it anything you want, HTML or anything, it will just draw it like text. It won't try to turn it into HTML. That's the difference. Clear? Other questions regarding that one? Good. OK. So we also, in HTML, if you recall, have a notion of an input tag. What is an input tag used for? Yeah, to take information from the user, right? So an input tag with type text, where's my input tag? Input tag of type text is a text box. I can write in it, see? So that's what an input tag is. Then on the input tag, I can do title something or other. Notice this adder. This means add an attribute. An att Let me explain what an attribute is. Suppose you add an h1, and then in it you have hello world. I can have an attribute like title. Wow, it worked. And now if I mouse over it, you see that, right? That came from title. So these extra things, these extra parameters that you pass to your element are called attributes. I'll say this again. Extra parameters that you're passing into your element are known as attributes. It's an attribute, yes. So that means what I can do here is I can do dot adder. Adder is a function that allows me to programmatically set an attribute on an element. So what does this do, in your opinion? What's the first thing it does? What, what does this part here do? Exactly. Perfect. This part will select the tags, which in this case is this here, the input. It will then set an adder, an attribute, by this name of this value. So what, having seen what you just saw, what will happen if I mouse over input? Hang on. There it is. See it? Do you see it? It's that. OK. And remember, we added that with code, right? We changed the value of the title programmatically. Pretty cool. What else can we do? We can change the CSS, right? Which you saw in a previous slide. So in this case, what am I selecting? What is this selecting? Things having class MSG, which is this element here. In fact, let me instead add a whole bunch of them. OK, so this would select all of these. Yes? Yes? OK, so then we do dot CSS, background, light blue. What do you think that will do? Good. Hang on, dot MSG. I can then do .css of font weight bold and font color red. So hang on, let me put something in this message. The fuck? Let me check out that one. Ah, it's this. Sorry, sorry. It is working. It's working. Okay. So uh, what this is doing is it's selecting these divs. It's setting a background of light blue, which is why we have light blue here. It's saying have the font weight be bold and the font color be red. But the font color is not red. What the heck? Hang on. Oh, why did I do font color? That's wrong. It's color. There you go. 
By the way, that's a tricky thing. Did you guys notice that in CSS? There's no such thing as font color. Color means font color. Don't ask me why they did that. They were just very mean people. OK. So color means red, font color. Do you guys see how we this resulted in that? A little bit. OK. So there's this other thing that jQuery does. Yes? OK, good question. All right, so listen, so OK. So clearly we're missing something. So the question was, why don't we just do this in a style tag, right, inside of our CSS? Why do we have all this code? OK, suppose you wanted to make one of those menus where when you mouse over, it sh right? And when you mouse out, it sh You know what I mean? OK, how would you make that? What you, right, if you, the CSS that you have gives you the initial rendering, right? That is to say the rendering that you get at the beginning. But then when the mouse goes over, you want to change the CSS, right? You want to change the width of that element to be bigger. When you move out, you want to change it again to be smaller, right? How do you change that? With JavaScript. Make sense? Does any, sort of. Does anyone not understand why this is useful? Up until this point in the browser, everything we've done has been out to the console, right? We have been console logging everything to that weird window that you can't even see unless you decide to open it. That's not very useful if you think about it. That's mainly used for developers. If you want to have an effect in the UI, if you want to draw something that users can see, can play with, can click on, whatever, you have to change the actual HTML. And a mechanism by which you can do this is this. You can change the text. You can change the HTML. You can change the style, right, using CSS. And many other things that we'll see pretty soon. Yes? Yeah, but then you're limited by, yes. OK, so you're talking about in CSS, you have like a colon hover and things like that. Yeah, but then you're limited. You, you can't specify all the different logic in CSS that you can do with JavaScript. OK, so um, a lot of people say that CSS is a programming language. No. Or HTML is a programming language. Why are these things not programming languages? OK, so a long time ago, actually not that long ago, you guys ever heard of Alan Turing? Yeah, yeah the father of CSS, of co CSS, oh my god, no. <laughs> the father of CS, that is to say computer science. No, he was way smart. Um, so he, one of the questions he was trying to answer, this might matter to you, is what is computable? What is computable? What can you compute? There are things you can't, no, you can't, no, there are things you cannot compute, and then there are things you can compute. And how do you know when you can? It's a simple question, actually. But how do you answer this? And so what he did was he came up with this thing called a Turing machine. A Turing machine is basically, it's a very simple construct. It's this like long strip of, I don't know what, it's just a long strip with like a head that knows how to do some very basic operations. It knows how to add, it knows, uh, sorry, it knows how to write, it knows how to delete, it knows how to move the tape around and do some very basic commands. It's a very simple structure, but what he said was this, that anything that is computable can be computed using this very simple machine. Anything that you can't do with the simple machine, you cannot compute. Simple answer, right? So now we have a class of programming languages like Java, C, whatever, Perl, Python, JavaScript. These are all programming languages that are used to do logic. That is to say, to compute over some data, right? To compute over information. 
The question is very simple. Which of these programming languages are the same as far as what they can do as a Turing machine? If a programming language can do everything that a Turing machine can do, it is known as a Turing complete language. Turing complete. Again, Turing complete means the programming language can compute anything that a Turing machine can compute. If it is not Turing complete, then it cannot do everything that a Turing machine can do. With me? Okay. So certain languages, so CSS is a language. It's a language, but it's not a, I wouldn't say a programming language because it's not Turing complete, right? You can, th it's a styling language. Yeah, exactly. Uh, HTML is also a language. It's a language. It has a syntax, it has a grammar, it's a language. But it is not Turing complete. This is the difference between languages like JavaScript and C++ and things like SQL or HTML or all of these other things that, where you can't really do complex logic. Is that clear? Okay, and the cool part is, is once you understand how to work with a single Turing complete language, learning another Turing complete language becomes much simpler because you understand how these languages work. You understand what it means to have a conditional, what it means to recurse, what it means to loop, which is why once you understand JavaScript, where the syntax is easy, going from that to Java or to C++ is going to be much easier than starting from C++. Make sense? Which is exactly why we began with JavaScript. And later you will study Java and then later you can study C++ moving forward. Okay. So back to jQuery. So in uh, CSS, we can have classes, as you recall, right? Now what's cool is that you can actually add and remove not just CSS styles, but actual classes. This is a class that has background red, right? This is a div that has a class sample. Not test class, it has a sample, which is why the background is not red, because this class and this class are not the same. Clear? But in code, I can actually add this class to this element. How? First, I select this element. I could have also selected using, say, div, right? So I've now selected this div. I can then do add class, test class, and it turns red. Make sense? I can then just as easily remove the class, making the red go away again. What do you think toggle does? Exactly. So if it has the class, it removes it. If it doesn't have the class, it... Exactly. Which is why we get that. So here we add the class, here we remove the class. The class does not exist, so it gets added. If I were to do that, the class existed, so it removes it. Make sense? Now you might say, why is that useful? Well, imagine you had lots of really, lots and lots of styles associated with a class. Instead of having all of that in your code, you could have kept that all in your CSS and then just turned on the class and right, it just inherits all of that style. Make sense? Yes? A little bit. Okay. Let's keep going. So this is a kind of a cool feature. But to explain this feature, let's forget about jQuery for a moment. I create an object. I attach to this object a foo, which is a function. I attach to it another function, like bar. Uh, this function, console.log yay. This does a console.log nay. Whatever. Okay, 
So what I can then do is I can call these functions by doing a.foo and then a.bar. And what I get is yay and nay. This should be clear. Yes, nothing new here. But here's what I'd like to do. What if the function returned a and this function returned a? What that means is I could actually do that. Let that sink in for a moment. Every function call returns A, right? That means this will return A, so I do A dot bar. That returns A, so I do A dot bar. That returns A, so I do A dot foo. That returns A, so I do A dot foo. That returns A, so I do A dot bar. That is the same as me doing a dot foo, a dot bar, then a dot a dot bar, ah, la, then a dot foo, then a dot foo, then a dot bar. Does that make sense? No. Okay. Fine. 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 A dot foo is a function. Yes. What does it return? A. a, right? OK, that means if I call this, it's going to return A. I then call a dot bar. What does bar return? A. I call a dot bar. What does that return? How can we, then, how can we access yay or nay? Oh, it wait, it depends on what function. If you call foo, you get yay. If you call bar, you get nay. What do you mean? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you understand this concept? So this is called chaining because it looks like a chain, right? Something dot something dot something dot something dot something dot, right? So you have this notion in jQuery. So what you can do Watch what this does. We select the div, then we do .html hello world. That then returns the same jQuery object, which we can then do .css font weight bold. That then returns the same object, which we can do .adder title hello. Which, what does title do? <laughs> tooltip. It adds that, that. It's called a tooltip. Okay. So again, look, we call a function. That function returns the same object on which we call CSS. That returns the same object on which we call adder. This is the same way we just did foo, dot, you know, call, dot, bar, call, dot. Same thing. Is that clear? Who's not clear about this? OK, OK, OK. Watch this. Forget jQuery. Look, forget jQuery. Const a is an object. A has a function like f. That function is going to do something like console.log fff. We have another function, a.f1. Console.log f1111. Let's have both of them return a. With me so far? OK. So now, if I were to do a.f, what would this return? A. Right. So that means the result of this is a, yes? Well, if the result of that is a, and we know a has f1 on it, why can't I just do dot f1? If, what does f1 return? What does a have inside? f and f, well, two functions attached to it, right? So that means I can do dot f1 or I could do dot f, et cetera. It's, make sense? So this, right, so the same thing happens here. Look, 
A in this case is this. We can then do a.html, whatever this will return a, which we can then do .css on it, which will return a, which we can then do .adder on it, which will also return a. Yes? Yeah, so you can chain them together, exactly, yeah. Exactly. Other questions? You could, we could have also done this way, just so you could see it. There you go. This is the same thing, right? So we do .html, then we do .css, then we do .adder. In fact, a lot of times, you, if you read other people's jQuery, you'll see these long chains where they do like 50 different modifications of an element. Yes? It's, you're saying it's not convenient, yeah, or it is? OK, so what you're advocating for is you're saying, let's, why couldn't we just do that? Right? OK, so look at this again. Now watch this. Oh, sorry. I, I forgot, yeah. Did a lot change in between? Not a lot, right? But one thing that did change is I wrote less code. Yes? And also remember, I named my, my variable A. Is that good? Is it okay to name your variables A? Yeah, really? No, it's a horrible, horrible thing to do. Why? Because what is A? When you're reading your code and you just see A, B, C, D, that tells you nothing about what's happening, right? Yeah, yeah fine, that's still horrible. Um, so instead what you do is you give your variables names that you can understand. If this div was meant to be like a profile, profile name, let's say we're trying to put a profile name in here. Instead of hello, we're putting in Joe Schmo because that's his profile name. Here I might do something like profile name, right? Okay, now watch this. If I were to follow the convention that you suggested, watch what happens. Do you see how that's way more just stuff than just that. So one of the things that you will learn as you do web development is that size matters. I know, I know. Uh, okay, we're grown-ups. No, we're not. I'm not. All right, so the more stuff you have to download, the longer it's going to take, right? The more bits you have to download from the server, the longer it will take. I grow up, seriously. The more bits you have to download from the server, the longer it will take, yes? OK, that means the longer your text is, your JavaScript is, the more stuff you have, the longer it will take to load. Load time is really important when you're talking about web applications. Because you don't want people, eh, blah, blah, shush. you don't want people coming to your website and just waiting for an hour for it to load. It needs to be fast, right? So pay attention to things like that. Try to keep your code readable, clean, but small. Also, the more code you write, the worse it is. Which is why I keep telling you guys, if there are two ways of doing the same thing, but one is just clearly simpler, and usually simpler means smaller, do that. The best programmers are the ones who can build really big, complicated, scary looking things in a very simple way. That's skill. That's the difference between a really good programmer and just like someone who graduated college. Got it? Okay. So why don't we graduate with one big program? What? Why don't we graduate with one big program? Look, if you guys start programming now, if you don't just go to class and then go home and then go to a cafe or whatever you do, gorsa gorsa, I don't know what you do. If you actually start Writing code, like working on projects, doing a startup perhaps, 
Now, in four years, you'll be monsters, like no problem. But if you don't, if you just go to class, do the homework and go home, four years from now, you're not going to get jobs. You'll get internships at best. It's up to you. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay. So this is also really interesting. Watch this. So a very common thing that you will do, listen, 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 is suppose I have lots of elements on my screen. I have a div. Inside of that, I have something else, like an input type. Inside of that, I have an h1. Whatever. I have a whole bunch of stuff. And I want to select I want to select specifically this one. One thing I could do, of course, is give this an ID that is different from this ID, right? But here's another thing you can do. You can select an element, like this one, by class name. So that's what, uh, hang on, let me get rid of this. Dot class name. So this will return to me a list of things that just contains this one value in it, right? This here. I can then do dot find h1. What do you think that will return? Will it return this? This one. Why? Because it's all the in our class. Yeah. So what this allows you to do is to localize your query. What I mean by this is your query won't run against the entire page, but only relative to, that is to say starting from, the element that you select. Yes? Huh? Ah, okay. So you might so he's asking where is the reference to jQuery? Like before there was a script tag that had source blah 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 jQuery. So I, in my system, in this slideshow, have a global reference to jQuery, so I can use jQuery anywhere without, it's already in there. But when you do your homework assignments, you have to include jQuery, otherwise you won't have jQuery. Okay, so just assume it's in there. Fair? Other questions? Okay. All right, so what find allows you to do is to localize a query. In this case, we're selecting just this element, and then relative to that element, we're finding all the h1s. So if I were to do this as an h1, I guess this doesn't make sense anymore, let me get rid of that. What would this query return now? And? It returns a jQuery object that has elements in it. Which elements would it have? It would have this one, and it would have this one. So that means if I were to then do dot HTML, oh, uh, okay, that's not going to work. What do you mean, why? Here's one, here's the other. What, what's your question? This? Oh, we have two minutes left. Oh, wait, we're already past three minutes. Why did they both appear? Oh, dot, because, it, because, what is UL? Unordered list. Ordered list would give me numbers. Unordered list gives you, right, okay, good. Okay, so, um, quick thing. I posted uh, a video series on jQuery. It's a tutorial. I suggest you watch it. Um, and review it and try to play with it yourself. Don't just watch, like actually try to manipulate some HTML. 
Because once we can do this, well, there's one step missing, one step, which is communication between your code and the server. In other words, how can you from your code send a message to the server and get a response back? If you can do that and you can change the DOM, you have almost everything you need to start building web applications, which is kind of cool. OK, it's very cool. Questions? No questions. All right, let's take a photo. Hey! Yeah, that's it.